From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Vines. The first criminal trial of a former president is set for March 25th in New York. While in Atlanta, the Fulton County D.A. is grilled over her romantic relationship with the lead prosecutor in the Georgia election interference case. We'll talk with former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin. And the House leaves town, set to return just three days from a deadline to avert a partial government shutdown. House Majority Whip Tom Emmer of Minnesota will be with us this hour. And Manchin Romney 24, the senator from West Virginia, floats the possibility today. Kaylee, we're never too far away from another no-labels story, and that appears to be what this was. Yeah. Uh, just another interesting day here in the nation's capital and on the campaign trail, though what was happening in Atlanta seemed to capture most people's attention, even while this criminal trial was set for March 25th in New York. It's been a big day in news related to the legal cases, the multitude That's of them sure. that the former president is facing. This one in Georgia, of course, is not just one he is facing, but 18 other co-defendants that have been brought, uh, have charges brought against them in this racketeering case. And potentially, depending on the judge's decision here, that could be derailed if indeed Fonnie Willis, the district attorney, is disqualified. She took the stand herself earlier today. In fact, she is still testifying. But here's a taste of what she said earlier. You've been intrusive into people's personal lives. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. But the question, Joe, is, mm. is what happens to her in this conflict of interest question yeah. going to impact the outcome of whether or not a trial takes place at all? Well, that's all absolutely defendants. right. It could either slow things down or end this trial. Of course, one of many uh, facing the former president. And joining us now to get into this and our other top stories, Bloomberg's Eric Larson and Akela Gardner. Eric, let's begin with you here on Donald Trump's uh, legal challenges and a pretty complex day involving three separate cases. I'm going to start with you on what happened and is happening today in Atlanta because so many Americans have had their eyes on this very dramatic testimony uh, from the Fulton County DA going into very specific details about vacations she took with the prosecutor, how money was transacted, even her preference in vodka brands. What will be the result of this testimony? You know, that's the big question here. This judge, he, he, he's made it clear that he wanted to hear from Fonnie Willis. Uh, she was really being grilled, as you mentioned. She's still being questioned. And she, at times, was a little evasive, not wanting to answer questions directly or giving sort of meandering answers. And the judge frequently put her back on track and asked her to answer questions, but also told some of the lawyers to change their questioning. You know, it's just really a lot of drama. It's not the kind of thing that any prosecutor wants to have to experience in the middle of this extremely high-profile case. Uh, but you can be sure that uh, Donald Trump and his legal team is pretty happy to see this playing out the way it is. Mm -hmm. Well, they may be happy to see this playing out, but perhaps they weren't as happy to see the outcome of the hearing where you are in New York, which you actually attended related to the Alvin Bragg case in which he's faced with more than 30 felony counts of falsifying business records. The judge confirmed the date, March 25th. We are now just weeks away from a former president of the United States going into criminal trial. There's no chance, Eric, that this gets delayed. We will see him in court that day, right? There is not any out that I'm aware of. Certainly by the end of the hearing, the judge had made it clear that he was going to see everyone in the courtroom on March 25th to start jury selection. Um, they, you know, they started the hearing. It was clear that Trump and his lawyers were expecting to have arguments about whether they should delay the trial. I think that they were really hoping that they would be able to delay it by months, potentially even until after the November election. But the trial started with the judge immediately ruling that the trial would go ahead on March 25th. Um, and, of course, Trump's lawyer said that that was outrageous, it was unfair. But the judge just w shot them down one after the other, every argument they made, um, and said, let's move on. Let's, they started talking about specific questions to ask potential jurors and things like that. So it's clear this trial is going to happen and that we'll have about six weeks, uh, approximately, of witnesses and testimony in this extremely politically charged case. 
All right. Bloomberg's Eric Larson joining us from New York this evening. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, here in Washington, a lot of buzz in the last few days over U.S. intelligence that apparently shows that Russia is discussing the possibility of basing a nuclear weapon in space. This, according to people familiar with the matter, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby updated reporters about this earlier today. While I am limited by how much I can share about the specific nature of the threat, I can confirm that it is related to an anti-satellite capability that Russia is developing. I want to be clear about a couple of things right off the bat. First, this is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. Let's turn now to Bloomberg's Akela Gardner, who covers the White House, which clearly Akela is trying to maybe cool things down about panic over this threat. Yet we were literally just moments ago hearing from the House Speaker Mike Johnson speaking to reporters alongside the chair of the Intel Committee, Mike Turner. Johnson saying this is a serious matter. It does involve Russia, needs to be addressed in an immediate way. How seriously is the White House taking this? Yeah, well, we heard John Kirby today basically say that this is an anti-satellite capability, but we did not say, hear him say what we know on background from sources that this could potentially be a nuclear weapon that Russia is discussing and developing. So certainly they were trying to calm the nerves that were really sparked by a statement from Congressman Mike Turner yesterday, where he basically demanded that the White House declassify in information related to really a vague national security threat. So this is all prompted from that. And so I, absolutely the White House had to come out and sort of calm the alarms that were set off across the country hmm. and the public was really facing in the in the face of this statement from Mike Turner. A lot of questions were still asked. Asking, though, despite their attempt to deliver at least some sketchy information to Canada, it comes just a day after there was reporting uh, that, and, and we have yet to hear confirmation from the Pentagon or the State Department on this, that Russia used a hypersonic missile, a cruise missile, for the first time in its war uh, against Ukraine. This is another piece of technology that we do not have. The timing here for the administration is not great in explaining this, is it? Of course, because there's also a war happening, right? The war in Ukraine. But I think something that's important to keep in mind here is there's really been tension between Congress and the White House when it comes to transparency over national security interests. Mm -hmm. One major thing is Congress has been demanding that Biden seek their approval before he takes out some of these strikes in the Middle East, specifically mm -hmm. in Yemen, Iraq, and Syria. So I do think this is a broader issue that we're seeing and tension that possibly could have sparked Mike Turner's statement yesterday. Yeah, eerie as it was. And of course, you allude to the Middle East while there's the active conflict in Ukraine as well. And just on the subject of Russia itself, video released by the Kremlin shows Russian President Vladimir Putin answering a question about which of the two leading U.S. presidential candidates, that would be Biden and at this point Trump, would be better for Russia. Take a listen. Biden. Biden. He is the more experienced person. He is predictable. He is a politician of the old formation. But we will work with any U.S. leader who the American people have confidence in. So when the Russian president suggests he'd rather you be president, I would imagine that's not the kind of endorsement the Biden White House or campaign actually wants to receive. Yeah, the White House was asked about this, and they did not obviously welcome this. And these comments are really surprising, obviously, because Putin and Trump have had somewhat of a good relationship. Trump has consistently praised him, but I think something that is not being really considered in potentially fueling this praise is Trump wants this war in Ukraine to end. He says he does not approve of continuing to send aid. If Trump were to be elected, he could force these two countries to come to the table to bring a solution to this, and it could be a signal that Putin really wants this war to continue. He might benefit from Biden continuing to send aid to Ukraine and having a longer drawn-out war. Hmm. Or maybe... We've just got a little reverse psychology going on here. <laughs> Something to consider. Bloomberg's Akela Gardner, it's always a pleasure to have you with us here at the table covering the White House for us. At Bloomberg, coming up, we'll have a member of the House leadership with us, an important voice in a chaotic time. The majority whip, Tom Emmer of Minnesota, is coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
On impeachment, last night was a setback, but democracy is messy. We live in a time of divided government. Uh, we have a razor-thin uh, margin here, and every vote counts. Sometimes uh, when you're counting votes and people show up when they're not expected to be in the building, it changes the equation. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson last week, a day after the House failed to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and failed to pass their standalone Israel aid bill. Republicans, of course, though, as we told you, went on to impeach Mayorkas on a second round. But foreign aid remains a big question right now, as does funding the government beyond next month. We have much to discuss with Congressman Tom Emmer of Minnesota. He's the House Majority Whip. And Mr. Uh, Congressman uh, Emmer, it's great to have you with us. On it's good to be Welcome. with you, Joe. Yeah, yeah. You must be feeling uh, the vibes of recess, and I'm sure that you're one of the last people standing in the building. I hope you can hear me all right, sir. Um, I, it just popped but out. But when I you come in. back, no problem. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. When you come back, you're going to have three legislative days uh, before the government begins shutting down. Should we start bracing for a government shutdown in a couple of weeks? No. I, in fact, uh, I know that the uh, House and Senate uh, uh, negotiators, appropriations uh, uh, subcommittee chairs, have been working on all the bills, uh, trying to reach agreement. I know that one of them they were trying to close out today. There may be several others they were trying to close out today. But they'll do that over mm -hmm. the next uh, week or so. And when we come back, the key is going to be what are the packages that are put on the floor uh, and, you know, what, what's going to drive the, uh, the votes that'll, that'll get them across the line. But we should be, uh, we should be there before the first deadline of uh, March 1st. And then, of course, we get the second deadline, which is Martha, March 8th. So, Congressman, the understanding we should have then is that avoiding a shutdown will happen by passing multiple appropriations bills in just a few short days, not by doing another stopgap measure. Right. The, uh, you're not going to get another uh, continuing resolution out of our conference in, in Congress. Uh, the last one was, uh, was difficult. And that was done because our speaker uh, recognized that there just wasn't enough physical time to process all the bills once the, uh, the House and the Senate had agreed on the top line number. So uh, this time you're going to have to get these things passed. And they're talking about you won't have time to do 12 individual bills. Uh, they're talking about doing them in something called minibuses, maybe three or four, where you put three or four bills in each one uh, and pass them as a group. So you get these minibus bills passed. In a perfect world, the president stops by and delivers the State of the Union that night, and you still have a couple of major issues to deal with, Congressman, including the matter of foreign aid. The Senate sent you a bill that the Speaker says is DOA, and I know that you're working on what some in Washington are calling a Plan D for dog, what's that going to look like, and can you pass it? Well, Joe, I think people forget that we passed an Israel bill back in uh, back in uh, uh, October. Uh, they've already got a, a bill over there that came from the House on the stuff that they sent over. Uh, remember, this uh, was going to include border security. Uh, once they could not perform on the border security side of it, uh, then they sent over a bill that had everything in it uh, that will not, uh, it's, you can't pass it on the floor. You'll have to break it up. You'll have to downsize it. Uh, Ukraine is a great example. Uh, you don't need $60 billion. You can take the humanitarian aid and the, uh, and the government supports. Make that the responsibility of the EU, who just committed 10 billion euro over the next 10 years. There's a way to do this, but uh, not the way the Senate has sent it over. Okay, but what would yours look like? Is there a plan D that's about to emerge? Well, look, bottom line is you've got a White House and a Senate that are apparently used to working with a Nancy Pelosi controlled House. Uh, you've got a new majority in the House. You have to talk yeah. to the Republicans and you have to work with the Republicans. So I would say that uh, when it comes to the border security issue, uh, let's see if we can uh, figure out how to get that done. Because Americans, uh, you know, 80 percent of Americans want the border mm -hmm. sealed and, and they're not doing it. Well, you correctly point out, Congressman, that this is no longer a Nancy Pelosi controlled house. It's no longer a Kevin McCarthy controlled house. It is a Mike Johnson controlled house as speaker. And yet in recent weeks, we have seen a FISA, an extension of Section 702, pulled twice. As Joe already mentioned, the failure of the Israel vote and the first impeachment of Mayorkas attempt last week, a rule for assault cap raise went down last night with 18 Republican votes 
as well. Just what exactly is happening in a Mike Johnson controlled house right now? Well, let's first go back to the Israel bill that now Joe and you have both said that it failed. Let's explain why it failed. It failed because 80 percent of Democrats voted against Israel aid and I would argue in favor of the terrorists. That's not a, 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 the right outcome. Uh, they're the ones who took down the Israel aid bill. And uh, when you talk about what we're doing, that's just a people process. People have uh, differences uh, of uh, differences of opinion on policy, which is the salt issue that you're talking about. And then when you talk about Mayorkas, everybody knows that uh, that was a, that was a great play by the Democrats. Uh, they actually brought someone in from the hospital to cast his vote. Good for them. Uh, we just had to delay it a few days and have all our people there and it got passed. In both of these cases, though, Congressman, as majority whip, did you know in advance that they were going to fail when you brought them to the floor? Well, no, you could never say that. But we did know that there is a possibility that the person that they said was not going to be there all week. I mean, you know, I, yeah. ha I hate to admit it, but I might have done that to you, too, Joe. I might have told you that, no, they're not going to be around and then brought somebody in at the last minute. The speaker was well aware of that. He made a decision to go forward, which I think was the right decision. I support it. Uh, so that he could get a vote and see where everybody was. Uh, and then we were ready for uh, Tuesday. And as you saw, it passed on Tuesday. Well, and then there was Israel that failed right after that. But I know we've, we've discussed that point in particular. As we think about, though, the leadership of Mike Johnson, there has been much talk, Congressman, of potential threats to his speaker's gavel. The idea that any given member could bring a motion to vacate should he put something that they do not like on the floor. How great of a risk do you think the speaker is in right now? Kaylee, I think everybody likes to talk about this, whether they're in your side of the business or they're here on the Hill. Bottom line is we've been down that road. I don't see that happening again. It's time to continue the process. Make sure that the White House starts talking to the new speaker, which uh, the president uh, is it's so far refusing to even entertain him uh, for a meeting. So again, I said uh, earlier, I think the White House and the Senate are using, used to having a Pelosi-controlled House. Uh, they got a Mike Johnson-led House now, and they need to recognize that. And let's talk with each other and resolve these major issues that Americans are counting on us to get done. You know what else we love to talk about, Congressman, and I bet you know where I'm going, is a discharge petition. These are the things that many journalists and politicians like to fantasize about but never happen because they would obviously come with high drama. But in this case, there seems to be a real conversation about it when it comes to the foreign aid bill. And I wonder, with all the consternation uh, surrounding this, if you do support funding for Israel, for Ukraine, would you support a, a discharge if it actually brought it to the floor? Absolutely not. That's the wrong way to do it. And, and I love everybody talking about it uh, because in reality, it's a very unlikely scenario. I, people like to talk about it, Joe, and say, well, you only need a few Republicans, but that's assuming that you have every Democrat. Right. And believe me, you've got Democrats that do not want to support Israel. You saw 166 of them last week. So the idea that uh, you're going to get uh, everything you want on Ukraine uh, and you're uh, not going to do Israel is uh, outrageous. So I think uh, if you talk in that, that theory, first, uh, Republicans aren't going to go that route. I'm confident of that. And second, you're not going to get all the Democrats to support it. Well, you say that there are some Democrats who would not like to support a measure related to Israel. It also seems clear that there's at least one Republican who would prefer not to see a measure supported on a border deal. As he made very clear, former President Donald Trump has been putting his thumb on the scale, if you will. To what extent do you think he is contributing to the chaotic nature we have seen in the House? Well, first, uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, border stuff, which uh, I think that's what you're referring to, uh, the uh, President Trump's been talking about that long before anybody else was. It was the uh, centerpiece of his 2016 Sure, but he specifically uh, uh, said uh, the House should win. not be passing this legislation. Yeah, well, uh, look, he ha is entitled. He's on the campaign trail. He's seen it. We should not have passed that border bill. Uh, think about it. The House sent over a border bill last May that has reform to uh, finish the wall, reform to parole, reform asylum. Uh, it ends catch and release, and it restores remain in Mexico, which, by the way, our Border Patrol has said would staunch the flow by 70 percent overnight. What did the Senate produce? It, the product they produced did not do anything to finish the wall, didn't reform parole, didn't 
reform asylum, didn't restore Remain in Mexico, and instead codified the illegal uh, release of, uh, of uh, immigrants into our country that uh, Secretary Mayorkas has been doing, uh, subverting the law. So that is a non-starter uh, for everyone. And it, you, again, Democrats have got to start talking to the House. The House is a Republican House. We're ready and willing to work to solve these problems that the American people expect solutions to. Uh, but you got to work together. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, uh, there are a lot of issues to work out here, uh, Congressman, and a lot of things could happen in the next year. You've already run for speaker once. If you had the opportunity to represent the Republican conference in this House of Rep uh, Representatives, would you do it again? Hey, I'm, I'm doing the best job I can as the whip. I support Mike Johnson. He's our speaker. Uh, he's going to remain our speaker, and we're going to stay in the majority, believe it or not. I'm very bullish on the election. Uh, Republicans will win in November, and when we do, uh, Mike Johnson will still be our speaker. All right, Congressman and House Majority Whip Tom Emmer, thank you very much for joining Bloomberg TV and radio this evening. We appreciate your time. Now, as we talk about the outlook for the 2024 election, we know the economy will very likely play a large role in the mind of American voters. And speaking of the economy, retail sales slid in January by more than expecting, uh, expected, indicating that consumers were taking a bit of a breather after a strong holiday shopping season. Joining us now for more on the outlook is Bloomberg's Michael McKeer, international economics and policy correspondent. So, Mike, an eight-tenths of a percent drop in retail sales. I guess you could say people spent a lot on the holidays and maybe decided to tighten up the purse strings a bit. But is this potentially a sign that we're about to see a more material deterioration in the consumption engine of the U.S. economy? Well, when you say material, that's the interesting question, because we should be seeing a decline in the uh, economy's growth rate because the Fed has raised interest rates and is trying to cut back on demand. The problem is, as we always say, never look at one indicator uh, in isolation. We know that there were seasonal adjustment issues with uh, January, and we know that there were a lot of storms across the country in February that probably impacted people's ability to go out and do some shopping. Uh, we also saw that there's only one service industry uh, item in the retail sales report, and that's bars and restaurants, and that went up significantly. Even so it wasn't like January. people people may not have been <laughs> able to get to the car dealership, but they certainly managed to get to the bars. <laughs> and so, does this mean we're going to slow down a lot? It's a hint, but it's not any kind of guarantee. Well, we will look at another uh, data point tomorrow's consumer sentiment. Right, we'll hear from the University of Michigan, which has been trending in a positive direction. It's something that the White House has been cheering. And a lot of our political analysts here look to it more than they do national polls right now to get a sense of the mood of the nation. What are you looking for tomorrow? Well, we're, it, the, the Michigan numbers are going to be very interesting because not only do we get the headline numbers and get a view of how people see the economy now, but they yeah. do break it down by party. And, of course, it works the same for both parties. Who's ever in power, their voters like the economy <laughs> and the others don't like the economy. <laughs> uh, I saw Charlie Cook yesterday from the Cook Political Report. He yeah. said he looks at the independents in the middle uh -huh. to see which way they're going. In the last couple months, they've been saying the economy is improving. So uh, certain people down at uh, Pennsylvania Avenue uh, and 16th <laughs> Street will uh, be looking at these numbers, I'm sure. But we're also, on, from an economic standpoint, going to be looking at the inflation expectations numbers, which have been coming down and suggest that people are getting the idea that inflation is improving. Real earnings came out this week, and real hourly earnings for the last nine months have now been above the level of inflation. Yeah. The question that everybody has is, when does the public realize that? Because they still seem to think they're losing ground. Well, great analysis, as always, from Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Great to see you at the Capitol, Michael, as always, and here at the table. Coming up on Balance of Power, a dramatic day in court for two cases involving Donald Trump. District Attorney Fani, F-A-N-I, last name is Willis. Fulton County DA Fani Willis facing Donald Trump's attorneys regarding whether she should be disqualified from the case over a relationship with one of the members of her team, the lead prosecutor. Coming up, former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin will join us to dig into this and more. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
You've been intrusive into people's personal lives. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. That was Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis taking the stand to testify about her relationship with Trump prosecutor Nathan Wade. This all pertains to the case brought against Trump and 18 other defendants in Georgia, the racketeering case that could potentially be in jeopardy, depending on a judge's ruling on disqualification here for Fonnie Willis. Joining us now is former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin to weigh in on this. It's been incredible television, I have to say. We've all been glued to the screens uh, over the last several hours to watch Ms. Willis's testimony. Did she do herself favors here, or is it your legal opinion that perhaps disqualification is more likely as a result of her testimony? Well, it was theatrical, for sure. But I think the judge asked a question at about 11 o'clock this morning, which was, what does the amount of money that Nathan Wade earned have anything to do with this allegations of yours? And I think it's not been a great day for the proponents of the disqualification. I think that they really haven't established any financial impropriety. They may have you know, some uh, doubt established as to when the exact time of the relationship's beginning was and when it ended. But I think that in the end, there is not going to be a sufficient basis for them to disqualify Willis or Wade or, more importantly, dismiss the case. Now, that all said, if I were Nathan Wade, I'd say, thank you very much. I'm glad I wasn't disqualified. But you know what? In the interests of calming the seas and, and letting this case go forward without political interference, I'm going to step aside. We heard a lot today, uh, Michael, about vacations, uh, about uh, a lot of cash transactions. We heard about uh, her preferred brand of vodka, spending time on cruise ships. We also saw a very combative uh, Fonnie Willis. Did she comport herself with the credibility of a district attorney? Well, you know what? She's under attack as if she is on trial. She said clearly, I am not on trial. And so if you're in her position and you are being accused essentially of essentially criminal wrongdoing, money laundering with cash and taking cruises with uh, independent contractors slash employees, then I think she has a right to be um, upset about that. Nathan Wade was much calmer in, in his demeanor, but people react differently to being accused. And, you know, I think that it was OK for her to show the emotion that she showed. Hmm. Well, and of course, we're ending the day discussing this legal case, the former president is facing, yet we started the day talking about another. In New York, the Alvin Bragg case, that trial has now been set for March 25th. It's going to begin just weeks from now, quite historic. And of course, we heard from the former president himself on that matter earlier today. Just take a listen. This is just a way of hurting me in the election because I'm leading by a lot. We're leading by numbers that nobody's ever seen before. We want delays. Obviously, I'm running for election. I can't. How can you run for election if you're sitting in a courthouse in Manhattan all day long? It seems, Michael, that he's going to have to try to do just that as this trial plays out. The judge says he expects it to last about six weeks. That means by what, May, we could be considering a presidential candidate that could be a convicted felon. How likely do you think it is, based on the merits of this case, that he becomes one? It's a difficult case and a simple case. The simple case is when you ask a jury, why would somebody spend money in the way that they spent it and record it in the books in the way that they recorded it if they didn't have anything to hide? when, if you will, they could have made the direct payment overtly. The reason they did it circuitously was because they didn't want the overt payment to be known in the run-up to the election. So that's the theory of why it went this way. Then you've got a lot of documents that set out how the monies were paid and how the monies were recorded on the books. You've got Michael Cohen. Sure, he's a fractured witness, but he's going to be talking about the documents. You've got David Pecker from National Enquirer, who will support 
um, Cohen's testimony. And then there's the wild card of whether or not Weisselberg, the CFO, will take the stand. He's, according to the New York Times at least, in conversation with the prosecutors because they may be charging with perjury in the New York fraud civil case. So there's a lot of stuff here that I think favors the possibility of a conviction. We frequently come to you for perspective, uh, Michael Zeldin, considering what we have here. I know it's something we were waiting for and expected, but the headline is remarkable and historic. The first criminal trial of a former United States president. What is this going to look like? What is it, what is it going to feel like? Well, it's going to be it's going to make the O.J. Simpson trial look like a regular day to day traffic court case. The amount of media circus-like attention it'll get is going to be beyond description. Uh, Trump will, in the hallways of the courtroom, argue that he's being persecuted. Of course, this case um, has nothing to do with him being persecuted or him being a, a political candidate. The events that gave rise to it predate his time uh, as you know, former president, about to be candidate president. But we'll get the hallway... Um, political stuff. We won't see what's going on in the courtroom, which will be a relief to everybody in the courtroom. And we'll just have to really wait for the jury to decide how this goes. Our reporters will let us know um, what the sort of temperature looked like in the courtroom. But I expect it will be a criminal trial that is unparalleled in U.S. history. So that's one of the criminal trials. Others could potentially quickly follow, specifically the one, Michael, here in Washington brought by Jack Smith. A lot of that will depend, though, on how quickly we have a decision on the immunity question, whether or not the Supreme Court does, as Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, has asked, quickly decide not to stay Trump's trial, which was originally scheduled for March 4th. How quickly, now that Jack Smith's response is in hand, do you expect the Supreme Court will make a decision on this? And what do you expect it will be? It should make a decision. They uh, meet in conference on today, the 16th, and they will make a decision about whether they want to hear this case uh, on the merits, whether they will hear it expeditiously or in the ordinary calendar, and whether they'll let the stay stand. They need more or less four votes to accept the case and to uh, reject the request for a stay, five in order to make it move expeditiously. But I think the fair outcome in this case is that he go to trial before the election. I think the American people, to you know, parrot the words of Richard Dixon, have the right to know whether their president is a crook. They have a right to know whether Donald Trump engaged in provable criminal conduct. And so I would hope that the way the Supreme Court would deal with this is, one, make sure that Trump is on the ballot in Colorado and every other state that he's eligible to be on, that he meets the qualifications for. And then two, set this down, let the trial court set this down for trial, probably in June, um, so that we get an outcome in enough time for the voters to deci decide whether a conviction or an acquittal impacts the way they will vote. That's former federal prosecutor, former independent counsel, Michael Zeldin. Thank you, Michael, for your insights as always today. Coming up with the date set now for Donald Trump's first criminal trial, we'll look at the political repercussions with our panel. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lyons. Donald Trump's hush money criminal case is now set to take place March 25th. That was confirmed today. And we assemble our political panel to talk more about it. Christy Setzer, president and founder of New Heights Communications, is here along with Lester Munson, international BGR government affairs principal. We saw it coming, Lester, but I keep saying at least that it feels different when it happens. The historical significance of this is huge. What will be the significance on the campaign trail? Well, he's already been in court. He's already figured out, uh, he, Donald Trump, has already figured out that he can kind of campaign from the courtroom yeah. uh, and use the media attention outside the courtroom to apparently to his advantage, at least in the primaries. 
uh, where this seems these kinds of uh, procedures, uh, processes seem to have helped him. Mm -hmm. Will it help him in the general election? Should he be the nominee, which it looks like he will be? Uh, that's I think that remains to be seen. So uh, this this trial, which which is coming fast at us, we may learn some things as it kind of plays through this this process and we get closer to the general election. Well, there's also the consideration that sure it earns him free earned media, but he may need that considering he's not going to be able to pay for a lot of other things he might have paid for if he's paying for legal fees. We learned in 2023 he spent $50 million. Bloomberg has done some analysis of his burn rate, suggesting he'll be out of the money he currently has by July. Is this ultimately, Christy, going to come down to whether or not his supporters are continually willing to put up money for his legal defense? Well, luckily, up to this point, they have been willing to. And he has been able to rely on the kindness of strangers to fund his campaign, as well as, not for nothing, the RNC that has said that, you know, screw the primaries. They are behind Donald Trump 100 percent, and they are willing to put every dollar that they have behind electing him. And also, you know, not to say that there's um, anybody down ballot that they care about. They just care about <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, so I think that actually, cash-wise, he's going to be fine between the parties, between um, between low-dollar donors. The, the real question is, again, whether that's going to matter or whether people's opinions of him are already kind of baked in, you know, regardless of how much money he has. Does Joe Biden just kind of watch this from the sidelines, let the tape speak for itself, hand the rope to Donald Trump? Or does the campaign need to be actively working with this? As Lester said, the, the, the courtroom campaigning has been going pretty well, it seems, for Donald yeah. Trump. How does Joe Biden seize on the moment? Should there be, you know, a rogues reel every night that the campaign releases? How do you do it? Yeah, I, I mean, there's definitely a robust conversation about this question. I am of the mind that they need to be putting out the contrast um, that absent that, I think we get to this place of sort of nothing else matters, or even that... Um, that Donald Trump gets a boost out of the fact that sure. he is, uh, uh, you know, with his base, he does, certainly. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you can think about, though, is, you know, for not that special elections mean everything, but every time that people have been able to come to the polls in the last year and a half, um, Democrats have outperformed. So mm -hmm. that's saying something very different than the polls are right now that show uh, Trump with a small but meaningful lead. Mm -hmm. Well, so there's the question of how Biden should play there. So there's also potentially a question of what this means for Nikki Haley. We've had a lot of conversation in recent weeks that perhaps she's just sticking in this because she has the resources to do so, and no one really knows the outcome of Trump's many legal battles. And yet, polls are not working in her favor right now. We got a Winthrop University poll that shows her 36 points behind Trump in her home state of South Carolina. The primary is just nine days away. Can she survive something that bruising and still have a political future? I don't think so. Uh, that's, those are, that's a big delta. Yeah. But it also kind of lowers expectations for her going into, going into the election in the next few days. Can she reduce that number? Can she cut it in half? Can she get to within 15, 18, 10 of Donald Trump? Then it looks like it might be a Nikki Haley win, even though she's just lost to him by double digits. Hmm. Well, enter Joe Manchin, who's been in the wings here waiting for this to be official, because no labels has said, right, if we get through Super Tuesday and we have Donald Trump and Joe Biden, they will run a candidate. We just don't know who that would be. Maybe Joe Manchin. Of course, the senator from West Virginia has been frequently mentioned and had an interview today, talked about who he might prefer as his potential running mate. That's how far down the road we are on this. Let's take a listen. So hypothetically, if I was picking my running mate, I, I would ask, uh, new, I would ask, really, who I would ask right now is Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. Okay. <laughs> Mansion Romney. Is that the great fear, something like that, for this White House? I, I mean, I guess the great fear is that he means it and that this isn't just grandstanding because he likes the microphone and he likes television cameras in his face. Mm. Um, I, I am someone that believes that Joe Manchin was ultimately more friend than foe to the Democratic Party and that he is no longer running because he knew that political gravity would catch up to him and he wasn't going to be able to maintain the seat. Um, I'm not thoroughly convinced that he ends up actually running. Um, if he does, I mean, sure, he wants to show you guys that he is not just a moderate, he's somebody who plays well with Republicans. I, I'm not convinced he does it. Yeah.
Wow. Well, there's the mansion specific question, Lester. There's also just the question of whether no labels is going to do it at all. They keep pointing us to Super Tuesday. But the fact is that's eight months out from Election Day. It's pretty late in the game. If they haven't even indicated who the candidate will be, how likely really is it you think they run one? It's so it's so hard to tell. (laughs) <laughs> right, a Mansion or someone else who's yeah. the who's the VP? Won't nominee. be Larry Hogan. He's uh, running for right. Senate. He's, he's apparently <laughs> made a decision. Uh, on the other hand, the two, you know, the Biden and Trump are so unpopular that it's hard to totally discount the possibility of a third party this year. If ever it was going to work, it mm-hmm. seems like this might be the year. And once you start getting into that math of three plausible candidates, all the old expectations go out the window. Remember, Ross Perot got 19 yeah. percent uh, 30 years ago or whenever it was after he kind of became a Looney Tune on TV. <laughs> I mean, he went a little bit crazy. Those were great CIA. Larry King what? shows. Come on, Lester. Yeah. I, go, I go back to Kaylee's question from earlier, though. Romney Mansion, who's at the top of that ticket? That's Do we believe the former question. standard bearer would run as vice president? Once you've been the presidential <laughs> nominee, can you downgrade to Veep? You I cannot. So. No, you cannot. <laughs> we have a problem with that, I think. Call Houston. Yeah. We have a lot more to discuss, though, here in Washington. Forget Houston, because we have to talk about Congress as well. Coming up, all eyes are on the supplemental bill and the significant hurdles it faces in the House. Also, the question of how a shutdown is going to be avoided just a few weeks from now. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. bottom line is you've got a White House and a Senate that are apparently used to working with a Nancy Pelosi controlled House. Uh, You've got a new majority in the House. You have to talk to the Republicans and you have to work with the Republicans. So I would say that uh, when it comes to the border security issue, uh, let's see if we can uh, figure out how to get that done. That was Congressman Tom Emmer of Minnesota, the House Majority Whip with us earlier this hour. And with us now, our political panel, Christy Zetzer, president and founder of New Heights Communications, and Lester Munson, international BGR government affairs principal. So Lester, he was talking there about what a Nancy Pelosi-controlled house looked like, but obviously we asked him about the Mike Johnson-controlled house. He told us that he thinks appropriations bills are going to pass in time to avert a shutdown when they come back from recess in just a few weeks. There will not be another stopgap, he says. When they've struggled to pass other measures in pretty incredible fashion, how confident are you in the confidence of the whip? Uh, not, not very. <laughs> uh, this, the, the, you know, the Republicans lost a seat this week. Their, yep. their margin is even smaller than it has been. There's no room to maneuver. Their, their members are all too willing to defy leadership, vote against rules on the floor. It's impossible for them to predict what's going to happen. This leadership, God bless them. Uh, they can't predict what's going to happen in an hour, much less three <laughs> weeks from now. So I, I think they, they ought to really be keeping their options open for uh, keeping, the, keeping the government running come March. Yeah, well, they've had trouble even passing rules uh, yeah. to get to spending bills. Are we shutting down in a couple of weeks? I think this is one where they can count on the support of Democrats. I think that if we do actually end up avoiding a shutdown, it will be because Democrats managed to persuade under a, few. a continuing resolution. Yes. Um, I, I mean, look, I, I think the question is really whether Johnson can't or simply won't govern. Um, he was coming from a place where he was the kid at the back of the classroom throwing spitballs. And now he's oh, the guy who has to actually teach the class and his friends, the former spitball throwers, are still there. So it's not really clear to me uh, that he knows how to do this job, obviously, yeah. or even that he wants to. When he hears the, you know, from Donald Trump that, um, you know, for example, don't let the border security bill pass, mm-hmm. I think he's going to take those uh, those cues. I think the radio hosts are always the kids at the back of the class. That seems to be like <laughs> the theme there. I don't know what that is. It's a former radio host. Uh, this is, fits into the analogy I, of Congress being yeah. like high school and right. all of that stuff. Junior Elementary right. school, maybe. <laughs> Some of the seniors apparently have decided they want to graduate, just not return to the high school at all, Lester. We've been talking in recent weeks about a number of very high-profile retirement announcements from committee chairs, the latest being yesterday, Mark Green of the Homeland Security Committee, fresh off a victory, impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. 
How problematic is the brain drain we are seeing in this conference if the people at the top are deciding they've had enough? Yeah, the numbers are very high. Uh, Mark Green, I think, is 59 years old. Mike Gallagher, yeah. uh, who announced his uh, re very surprised retirement a few days ago, I think is only 39. Correct. So these are, not, these are not older members. These are members who are kind of in the, in the middle of their career. Yeah. They have a real opportunity to kind of gather more power in Congress if they want to, and they're choosing not to stay. Uh, it could be because they see the they're, they're not happy with the chaos they see today and they foresee more chaos for the next four years. That is possible. But it really, it doesn't speak well of the institution that they're losing members this yeah. important this a, often. A lot of experience leaving Democrats, too. I think more than a dozen at this point. What does that leave us with in the House? Well, there's a little bit of asymmetry there in that a lot of the Democrats that are leaving are going to run for higher office. A lot of the ones, the Republicans that are leaving are of two varieties. Either they are the anti-Trump people who lost their election um, or decided not to run again, mm -hmm. or in, you know, in this case, they're people with a lot of seniority. So what it means, what it does leave, are uh, ungovernable extremists in the Republican Party and, or, and Democrats trying to act like the adults and not really getting that far. Wow. We have just about a minute left, but if you were to put an over-under odds on Mike Johnson making it through the funding battle oh, and God. the Ukraine aid question and still having the speaker's gavel, <laughs> would you take that bet? I would not take that bet. So you think he could be ousted? I think he could absolutely be ousted. He might be ousted in the next month. Yeah. Lester? I think he's going to be there through the rest of the year. Okay. I think even the Republicans have had enough of these speakership battles. Mm -hmm. People like Johnson. He's, he's still obviously growing into the job, uh, but he's a likable fellow, and he doesn't have that baggage that the last guy had. What's the potential sin, the CR or foreign aid? Well, if you ask Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's aid yeah, on the floor. Definitely. If you ask others, it's the CR. It's a pickle. We'll find out together. Christy Sesser and Lester Munson, great conversation. Thank you both. And check out the Washington Edition newsletter. If you haven't already, it's on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.